Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm Jennifer Ebling, and today is June 7th. Today in Garden History, we celebrate the birthday of Paul Gauguin, one of the leading French painters of the post-Impressionist period. Paul was born on this day, June 7th in 1848. Born in Paris, Paul Gauguin was a self-taught painter. He was also a rugged individualist, and his great talent helped introduce primitivism to the art world. In fact, his best primitive work was created on his 1895 trip to Tahiti. It was a place that he would spend the rest of his life. And the flora and fauna of the Tahitian landscape figure prominently into his work on the island. Over the span of his career, Paul was obsessed with art. He once wrote, color, what deep and mysterious language, the language of dreams. Speaking of dreams, when the poet Vincent van Gogh rented a yellow house in Arles, he dreamed of having Gauguin visit. And in preparation for his stay, van Gogh painted poet's garden in the bedroom that Gauguin was to stay in. And this painting depicts the public garden that was across the street from the yellow house, and Van Gogh famously filled the rest of the house with his paintings of sunflowers. When Gauguin finally arrived, he ended up painting one of his most famous pieces. It was a painting of his friend Van Gogh, painting his sunflowers. And over the course of the nine weeks that he stayed with Van Gogh, the two men either painted or argued. In fact, during one of their final fights, Gauguin supposedly sliced off Van Gogh's ear with a sword, although it's never been proven. Now, Paul Gauguin did not exclusively paint florals. He was more diverse in terms of his subjects. But one time when he was in a creative lull, he wrote, When I am able to paint again, if I have no imagination, I shall do some studies of flowers. And it was on this day, June 7th in 1878, that a man named Fisk Bangs wrote about his blooming white mustard in the American Bee Journal, volume 14. And so here's what Mr. Bangs wrote about white mustard. It began to bloom about June 7th and lasted nearly eight months. The bees commenced work on the 11th, and on the 19th of June, the bees were so thick that their hum sounded like Professor Cook's buzzsaw lacking the screech. This is one of the best honey plants, and I think its bloom can easily be regulated to have it come after basswood. So there you go. If you're thinking about having a pollinator-friendly lawn, consider adding blooming white mustard. And today we remember Ivan Maturin, the Russian botanist and plant breeder. He died on this day, June 7th in 1935. A Russian horticulturist and a master of selection, Ivan was an honorable member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Throughout his life, Ivan created all sorts of fruit plants. He introduced over 300 new varieties and was often called the Russian Luther Burbank. Ivan started out working on the railroad, and his job riding the rails gave him the chance to visit many famous gardens and nurseries around Russia. And it was this informal tour of nurseries that inspired Ivan to start a fruit tree nursery of his own in 1888. Ivan was maniacally focused on improving fruit, and to do so, he selected the best examples and then used them to improve the next generation. 
And although Russia would never support his work financially, they made sure that Ivan could never leave the country because the last thing that Russia wanted was for Ivan to bring his work to the United States, where many scientists had recognized early on the value of Ivan's work. And although the 1917 October Revolution hurt many landowners and farmers who were forced to give up their land to Mother Russia, Lenin liked Ivan, and with Nikolai Vavilov's encouragement, Ivan's work was protected as the intellectual property of the Russian government. Today, Ivan's most famous creation is the Antonovka, or the People's Apple. It was Ivan Maturin who said, We cannot wait for gifts from nature. We must take them from her. That is our task. And it was on this day, June 7th in 2013, that the author Jane Green planted zucchini in her garden. And then she wrote about her zucchini in a lovely little article called Conquering the Zucchini Beast. Here's an excerpt. Something's always happening in a garden. Upon entering the garden on the morning of the 4th of July, my dog Tootie and I found that four zucchini plants were in full bloom, and lo and behold, one plant had already popped out a nice-sized fruit. What a stupendous treat, and to think that I had planted my garden on the 7th of June and that I already had a zucchini fruit to enjoy on the 4th of July. What a cause for celebration. Of course, I did cheat just a teensy little bit because I planted zucchini plants and not zucchini seeds this year. But hey, it was still an awesome experience for me. With the glorious discovery of a zucchini fruit just waiting to be harvested, my brain cells started conjuring up all sorts of yummy zucchini dishes to prepare. For instance, making zucchini bread or zucchini relish or zucchini cake or zucchini brownies or preparing a wonderful zucchini hot dish. Yum. I call this zucchini mania time because there are so many foods that you can make with zucchini that you don't know which one to make first. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Darling Dahlias and the Red Hot Poker by Susan Wittig Albert. Well, this book is a brand new release today, June 7th, 2022, and this is a fiction book. And here's what the publisher wrote about Susan's book. It's Labor Day weekend, 1935, and members of the Darling Dahlias, the garden club in Little Darling, Alabama, are trying to keep their cool at the end of a sizzling summer. This isn't easy, though, since there's a firebug on the loose in Darling, and he or she strikes without any apparent rhyme or reason. What's more, a dangerous hurricane is poised to hurl itself in Darling's direction, while a hurricane of a different sort is making a whirlwind campaign stop, the much-loved and much-hated senator from Louisiana, Huey P. Long, whom President Roosevelt calls the most dangerous man in America. Add in Ophelia Snow's secret heartthrob, Liz Lacey's Yankee lover, and the Magnolia Ladies' garden of red hot pokers, fire red salvia, and hot pink cosmos, and you have a volatile mix that might just burst into flames at any moment. Well, author Susan Wittig Albert has brought us another delightful assortment of richly human characters who face the challenges of the Great Depression with courage and grace. And her books remind us that friends offer the best of themselves to each other, that community is what holds us together, and that even when life seems too hot to handle, there's always hope. And isn't that the truth? This book is 280 pages of some fun Southern garden fiction, and it's the perfect book to read after a long day in the garden.
You can get a copy of The Darling Dahlias and the Red Hot Poker by Susan Wittig Elbert and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $18 fun book. And I have to just say really quick that one of my favorite books by Susan is called The China Bales Book of Days because it's a day-by-day book and it has tons of garden information in it. And my copy is positively dog-eared almost every single page. So Susan, huge fan. All right, we end the show today with a celebration of another one of my favorite authors, Louise Erdick, the American author and gardener. She was born on this day, June 7th in 1954. A Minnesota-born Native American, Louise has written so many wonderful books that generally include a snippet or two about the garden. So I thought I would end the show today by picking a few of my favorite garden excerpts from a handful of her wonderful, wonderful books. Here's an excerpt from her book called The Beat Queen. I love plants. For the longest time, I thought that they died without pain. But of course, after I had argued with Mary, she showed me clippings on how plants went into shock when pulled up by their roots, and even uttered something indescribable like panic, a drawn-out vowel only registered on special instruments. Still, I love their habit of constant return. I don't like cut flowers, only the ones that grow in the ground. And here's an excerpt from McCoonts. The family took all the seeds from the garden, and then they buried Nokomis there, deeply, wrapped in her blanket with gifts and tobacco for the spirit world. They buried her simply. There was no stone, no grave house, nothing to mark where she lay except the exuberant and drying growth of her garden. Nokomis had said, I do not need a marker of my passage, for my creator knows where I am. I lived a good life. My hair turned to snow. I saw my great-grandchildren. I grew my garden. That is all. And the final excerpt is from The Blue Jays Dance. Full of the usual blights, mistakes, ruinous beetles, and parasites, glorious for one week, bedraggled the next, my actual garden is always a mixed bag. As usual, it will fall far short of the imagined perfection. It is a chore. Hard work. I'll by turns aggressively weed and ignore it. The ground I tend sustains me in early summer, but the garden of the spirit is the place I go when the wind howls. This lush and fragrant expectation has a longer growing season than the plot of earth I'll hoe for the rest of the year. Raised in the mind's eye, nurtured by the faithful composting of orange rinds and tea leaves and ideas, it is finally the winter garden that produces the true flowering, the saving vision. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening to The Daily Gardener. I truly, truly appreciate it. I hope you get to spend some time in your garden. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a garden friend. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Mm -hmm.